Hey everyone, it's Jim and Charles from Vows and More, an online vintage tube store. And today in tube lab number 164, we're going to talk about hidden roadblocks to achieving great sound. But first, caution everyone, electronics and tube amplifiers can have very high voltages present, which can be lethal. Exercise extreme caution when working around them. Always consult a professional technician when in doubt. Well, the plague visited our household, and even though I was much better by last Friday, I discovered I couldn't talk more than a few minutes. You can probably still hear it in our voices. And we both have a couple of lozenges going. <laughs> but luckily, we're mostly on the mend. And caution everyone, the holiday season is around the corner, in case you didn't notice. And it's at this time of the year that the tube scammers and equipment flim-flam artists come out in force. Their goal is to raise some holiday cash. Don't let them into your wallet. Save your money to buy something of quality that's well-reviewed, something that will last you a lifetime. And if that tube deal with that reproduction box looks like too good a deal to be true, well, probably is. Run. <laughs> In fact, we've been seeing so much equipment and tube scams and, oh my God, relabeling of Chinese garbage with huge prices. Yeah, it's terrible. And, um, and on the equipment side of things, can, can, we, can we keep putting names on this? Reprehensible. Reprehensible. Yeah, that's a good one. Disgusting. <laughs> um, uh, I think I'm out of words. Oh, well. Mm. So what were you going to say? Well, on the equipment side of things, mm. with, you know, going past the tubes, we're seeing a lot more equipment that's not designed to last more than a year of listening. Maybe they have circuit issues. Maybe they're just not well designed to begin with. And it's becoming more of a trend. And we're going to post a video, I think, over on the Melatone Kits channel that's talking about this a little, little bit more. We're going to take a look at uh, some of the amplifiers that are out there for sale. Maybe it's, you know, Chinese amps, things like that. And we're going to talk about what to look for whenever you're buying one. That is a huge red flag. Yeah, I think that's a great idea because it's, it's, it's like a, it is like a plague of bad equipment. Yeah. <laughs> so last week I built a prototype volume control and moved our already highly resolving analog system up one giant step in clarity. But before I show off the prototype, I think we should start at the beginning. Now, everyone knows that everything matters. Everything. When trying to achieve great sound at home. But what many of you may not realize is that there are roadblocks in your and our systems that prevent us from achieving that goal. Roadblocks that we may not even know exist. They can come in the strangest forms, as you're about to see. <laughs> when designing or reviewing your system, always try and achieve the simplest design topology. The shortest signal path, and that means no balanced circuits, no crazy long cable runs, and stay away from voodoo tweaks. The top roadblocks include your source material. Now, thank goodness, with source material, you, you just... Find the best sounding record version of your favorite track or the best digital uh, version. So source material, yeah, it costs us some time and some bucks, maybe even a lot of bucks. But it's easy to figure out with your ears. That's right. Now, some of you may be saying, well, I don't know if my system is highly resolving or not. Well, here is a simple, really simple trick to uh, figure out whether or not you're at that point where your system is, is at least resolving at a fairly high level. And that is if you play um, various pressings, let's say, of, of the same recording, whether it's digital or whether it's an analog record, you know, or a reel-to-reel -reel tape, doesn't matter. If you can hear clearly the differences between various masterings and pressings, 
then you've got a resolving system. If everything sounds the same, then your system is probably still the limitation. And the reason why that is, of course, is that the level of resolution in your system is below everything else. <laughs> so you can't hear the differences. And of course, years ago, that was the norm. But if you're watching this channel, you probably have a highly resolving system or you're trying to achieve it. So source material, yeah, but we can fix that. Speakers. I lived for years with speakers that could handle the kind of power I wanted. It's just a thing you did when you were young. And the, yeah, sure, they sounded fine, but were they highly resolving? No. Did I spend the vast majority of my audio budget on my speakers? No, I spent it everywhere else, which is dumb. Speakers, they're right at the top. Your room and your setup are really, really important. Voodoo cables and other witchcraft. Avoid, avoid, avoid. <laughs> your money is better spent elsewhere. Yeah. Keep it in your wallet. That, that doesn't mean you shouldn't have crappy cables, but you should at least have decent ones, and they don't have to be that expensive. Yeah, and if your cables have a direction marked on them, run. <laughs> okay, tubes. Yeah, if you've watched this channel, you know we've talked about, um, about the differences between high quality vintage tubes and modern reissues and uh, regular Chinese production and, uh, and other junk that's out there. The, yeah, sure, there are vintage tubes that's, that really suck, that they don't last, they sound terrible, but the vast majority of vintage tubes from the major manufacturers sound amazing, right out of the box. Now the, the, the better versions of those um, weren't made as anything special. They just happened to be, it's just like the, the better record pressing. The, it may not have been intentionally you know, mastered as the best version of that record, but it some, just so happened they had good engineers working on it or better material science, or they just had tighter quality control on the line. Or somebody cared. Or somebody cared, yeah. And I think that's the t same with tube production. Companies like Sylvania, Phillips, Mullard, Svetlana, Svetlana, they had people who were running those companies who were on, on the floor, uh, who cared, probably a whole bunch of people. And that makes a huge difference. After your tubes, your equipment. Now, you might say, Jim, why in the world, you design equipment. What, why in the world is equipment near the end of roadblocks well you really if if you're trying to achieve great sound at home you should have done your research your homework um, on the equipment you're running yeah you can easily go down a roadblock and end up with a piece of junk of equipment but not if you take your time and you're careful in selecting your equipment and in fact the whole reason why i got into designing my own gear was just how bad commercial stuff sounded and um, once you start hearing what pure class A sounds like, simple circuits, short signal pass, all tube gear, all tube circuits, oh my goodness. You, ne you never want to go back to anything else. There's yeah. no going back. Okay, so you may have gathered that the one of the roadblocks that you have no idea exists is your volume pot. Well, some of you out there are nodding. Yeah, yeah, Jim, we've known for years. <laughs> Good on you for catching up, they say. <laughs> well, for a long, long time, I wanted to try something called a stepped attenuator. Here's one here. It doesn't have its wrist resistor array, but we will look at it all um, soldered up in just a minute. But here's a selection of, of various volume pots that might be in your equipment. Now, these are analog. So... They have a resistive trace on them and an arm that just follows the resistive trace. We did a much more in-depth video on stepped attenuators and how volume pots work. It's over on our other channel, Melatone Kits. There's a link below. And if, you, if this is something you're interested in, um, then just definitely jump over there. That's where we're going to put more and more of our technical stuff. Tube Lab is more of a general kind of a show. Um, and um, 
show and tell basically. So this is a motorized Alps pot. It's beautifully made. Here's a remote control motorized volume pot. And yes, we're doing some development work because so many of you have said, Jim, Charles, we would love to own your preamp, but I can't live without a, a, rem control. a remote control. Yeah. So I don't know if we'll come up with something that satisfies our um, quality control requirements, i.e. we need great sound and we don't want anything interfering with that sound. Mm -hmm. You may have noticed with the kits that there's there just is nothing that doesn't need to be in those kits. Yeah, very minimalist. So if we do release something that is a remote control uh, volume pot, it's probably going to be something separate from the kits or an extra add-on that you can purchase for them. Maybe. But, well, we're going to take a look and see what we can find with them. So this is what's in our all of our preamp kits. This is the standard Alps. It's a 100K times 2. So it's a stereo pot. So there's two volume controls stacked, one on top of each other, or back to back. So when you control the volume like this, pretend that my fingers are a knob. <laughs> Changing both channels at the same time. That's right. And you're in, you're in hopefully in balance. Now, the big problem with any of these analog pots is that there's a deviation between channels. So the resistance is not quite matched. So one of the jobs that I have when I bring in these orders is I have to go through all of the pots and check to make sure that they're on spec and kick out the ones that are outside of the specifications. Yeah, I mean, these are 100Ks on the traces and sometimes we see them out as far as 10K on, on one side and that's just, a, you know, it's horrible. So those we throw out, yep. um, that's actually fairly unusual, but we're trying to get inside of 2%. So, but, what happens when you get when you switch over to a different technology into a stepped attenuator like this is that you essentially can match the resistors to an extremely close tolerance so your channel balance is essentially precise and there's there's a cost to this these are much bigger they probably need to be mounted in a separate chassis they're complicated to assemble but at the end of the day, the difference in clarity, at least on the uh, analog side, was a uh, mind blowing. I mean, <laughs> mind blowing. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. It was mind blowing, wasn't it? Well, I mean, Dad said, "Come listen to the to the new stepped attenuator in the system." I sat down and immediately I just heard the difference, and I could not believe it. That I, I, what was the first thing I said afterwards? Uh, I can't believe it makes that big of a difference. Yeah, you said that actually on our evening walk. You said it all, for <laughs> all the next day. And um, yeah, it did make that much of a difference. But the interesting thing is that level of improvement and clarity benefited the vinyl side, our all analog side, mm -hmm. immensely. It took it from what was already a highly resolving, great sounding set of sonics to something that was unbelievable. Yep. It was like we'd walked through another dimension and arrived at a place where sound is perfect. It was just that much of an improvement. But the interesting thing is, we've been working hard on the digital side, trying to bring it up to a higher level. And I've been doing some digital development work. We've made some improvements and some great strides digitally, but the extra resolution of this type of volume pot did not help the digital side. Uh, not as much as the analog, really. I mean, everything came through a little bit clearer. Digital tends to have a bit of a tr bit of trouble with the top end, with the treble, and uh, this didn't help it. It's already naturally slightly edgy. Yeah. And what we think is happening is there's just enough of a softening of the sound going through the resistive track of a traditional volume pot that it actually helped the digital side and that extra level of clarity and detail we don't need in the digital side um, but on the vinyl side it's already a very warm rich smooth analog sound yeah so it's welcome there it's welcome okay well let's take a 
a quick look and see what the prototype looks like. Okay, so here's um, here's the step attenuator. It's it's essentially a switching volume control. So it's got no gain. There's or electronic parts or power input or anything. <laughs> no, but it's quite an interesting little box. So there's two inputs on a standard double pole double throw switch with a center off. This is what we use on all of our preamp designs. Um, and it's very, very handy. There is an auxiliary ground post in case you have a grounding issue. That's always a handy thing to have. And you might have noticed there's two RCA outs, and there's actually the um, a parallel pair of RCAs. And what this allows you to do is to take your signal. So the signal would come, let's say, from your phono preamp into here, from your digital side into here, and it would go off to your preamp. And you could, if you had, let's say, a low-level input on a subwoofer, if you needed a second input, you could just pick it up off of here. Anyways, it was an idea. Or if you had a separate headphone amplifier, you can run it off the second output as well. Yeah. So, let's just flip it over. Um, as I mentioned earlier, there is a more in-depth video, and um, if you're really into this sort of technology, well, this is old school technology. When I was a young audiophile, this was the must have volume control. Now, as you can see here, here's your match pairs of resistors. Every single step, and this is a 24 step um, attenuator, sets a specific uh, leak to ground of the signal. And here's your ground connection right on the other side of the resistors. And that's all it is. That essentially volume, analog volume pots um, basically leak off a certain portion of the audio signal and whatever remains is the volume that goes into your, your next gain stage. Yep, so the higher the resistance you have between the signal and ground, the more goes to the gain stage. The less, the more of it goes to ground and lower the volume. <clears throat> Sorry, the lower the volume. Where it gets interesting, of course, is that um, the volume pots are set up on a logarithmic scale. And the log scale is an exponential scale. So, um, you know, three clicks isn't um, three twenty-fourths of an increase in volume. It might be a doubling of volume. Mm -hmm. And the reason why volume pots are set up on the log scale is because of how we perceive changes in volume um, in our own brains. And it basically helps us mimic what we would think of more as a linear change in volume. So setting up these resistor values was actually quite complex and it involved a fairly uh, complex spreadsheet. And But it allowed us to actually tune the values here and the range that we're working in so that most of these resistors are actually in what we would consider to be the normal listening range. So it gives us really fine control. And so far in our listening tests, we actually, we guessed right. I mean, we, yeah. we, we, had, we had to make some assumptions, but we also were able to take um, uh, known values off of our existing pot and use those as reference points. So what you're seeing here is probably the simplest, most accurate way to change the volume, bar none. Now, if you've got more modern equipment, you may well have digital switching equipment. And I'm not a huge fan of anything digital in my audio gear, but it may well work and sound good. I just don't have a lot of experience with it. But I w can talk about the clarity of this type of uh, stepped attenuator and I think this is um, this is probably state-of-the-art even mm -hmm. though it's old it's so it's really old-school technology I mean I was a young audiophile oh god it was over 40 years ago and uh, we were dreaming of stepped attenuators 40 <laughs> years ago um, so but 
Improvements in uh, build technology have brought the cost of these down substantially. Now, you can still spend a couple of thousand dollars for a fancy stepped attenuator. If you want. If you want. But I think we probably can put a kit together for a little less than that. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> okay. Um, Charles, you've got some interesting stuff. Let's reset and see what you got. Okay, well, what what came in this week, Charles? All right, well, we have a lot of tubes in the mail, as usual, but we did have some absolutely beautiful 6SN7s come in, and here's a few examples of them. And they're both early Sylvania GTA tubes. We have, oh, let's get that in focus. There we go. We have the two main versions of the GTAs. We have the later angle plate chrome dome, and the focus is, of course, giving us more trouble. And look at that beautiful chrome. These are great tubes. Full chrome without much fading is a really good indicator of a true new old stock uh, GTA. But the labels themselves, it's like they fade away to nothing. Yeah, so here's uh, one of our favorite tubes, which is the GTA straight plate full chrome. And I don't know if you can make that out on camera here. It's kind of hard to tell on the screen if you can see the label, but it's definitely darker. I don't know if it's something to do with the paint that they use, but it just tends to fade out over time. And that's a, this is a new old stock too. Uh, but you got to remember, these tubes were, were made um, 70 and 80 years old uh, ago. And uh, that's, <laughs> that's a long time ago. Um, I often uh, d date tubes relative to my own age and my father's own age and um, uh, you know a tube is really old when it's older than your dad um, so he doesn't like it when I tell him that but I think it's kind of funny. Oh, it just goes to show the quality of the production too that these tubes are still kicking around and they're still working as expected. I mean look at these testing numbers. 100 100 <laughs> on something that is uh easily uh two to three times my age yeah 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 and the the it, it, if you didn't want to fool around rolling in a lot of different types of tubes and you just wanted a great sounding 6sn7 gta which is very similar to a GTB spec-wise, mm -hmm. then the early Sylvanias, they're winners every single time. They're hard to beat. They, they just sound amazing. They've got a warm, rich sonic to them, and they have a really good level of detail. Sure, they're not tall, sexy-looking tubes, but they sound amazing. Well, with these chrome domes, they do look pretty good, though. So we've gotten enough in to make up, I think, a couple of matched pairs of each one that are tight testing, high testing, new old stock, and uh, they're in the store now if you're interested in them. Well, thanks for doing that, Charles. And if you stayed to the very end, here's some discount codes to help you out, and we can ship pretty much anywhere in the world for a flat $20. But if your order is $150 or more after discount, the shipping's on us, folks. And there's some secret codes that some of you are getting and costing us the big money. One is really easy to figure out, and the other one is huge. It's a big, big code, and it's only ever been used once, yes. <laughs> which is great because it costs us a lot of money. Stay safe, everyone. This is Jim. And Charles. Signing off. Cheers, everyone.